Nigel Fletcher is probably best known for being part of the successful 1970s band Lieutenant Pigeon, but he's had a varied and colourful life and he's crammed his time with many other interesting experiences. I spoke to him recently and discovered lots of things about one of his many loves, railways. I first asked him about his early years and how this hobby of his became a passion. Well, I was born at the end of the war, end of World War Two, and uh, so I grew up, my early years uh, were in a very austere Britain, um, playing on the old bomb sites and uh, everything was rationed. We, ha we had very little money, especially if you were young. <laughs> Pocket money wasn't heard of in those days. But but we knew no difference. We knew, as, as everyone who's born into this world, what you see is what, what you think it's always has been and always will be. Of course, that wasn't to be the case. Um, things were changing rapidly. Um, but uh, I would say in about 1953, 53 time, I discovered the uh, the marvelous hobby of train spotting. Um, today it's it's laughed at, but in those days, if you had no money, it was nice to go along, sit and watch the trains and try and see every particular locomotive. That That's all we were interested in in those days. And um, I think it was about 1954 when I had my first, uh, what, what we called Ian Allen Spotter's books. And they were they gave you a list of of all the different engines, so you could you could tick them off. And the object was to see every one. We never did, of course, because in those days you couldn't travel to the extremities of the country. You didn't have the money, so you missed all the Scottish stuff and the the, the stuff that never came in, in your area. But I would say. Uh, <clears throat> I was um, mad keen on all railways, especially steam locomotives. Of course, most of the stuff in those days was worked by steam steam engines. And um, I would say from about 1954 till 61, uh, that was uh, my my entire life. I mean, not not entire. I mean, I like I had a lot of other interests, but that was like the hobby, and that was. Uh, as soon as you could um, get a, a bicycle or get a bit of money to travel somewhere on the train and see other places, that was all we did in our spare time, especially in the school holidays. But by 1961, a lot of uh, a lot of diesel engines were coming in, and we didn't like them. <laughs> they were taking away the steam engine turns and. So um, I remember in the summer of 61 going to the West Coast Main Line and seeing uh, these, they were, they were later called peaks, um, D1, D2, D up to D10, and then a few of these uh, English electric type 40. Uh, we didn't call them class 40s then. We called them D200s, but they were the... Um, they, that was a very big class. They were creeping in. and So in 61, I, I turned my back on railways, got into heavily into music, and uh, I got into other things, like I wanted a motorcycle and um, discovered the opposite sex. And uh, so I really turned my back on railways a bit, um, which I do regret that now. And then from about... Uh, when, when I was about 18, I... Um, I went off to sea. I joined the Merchant Navy, had three wonderful years, during which time um, I'd travel by train to Southampton or Tilbury or wherever we were sailing from, and uh, I'd always look at the engines, see what was going on, but it was diesels were getting in everywhere. Apart that is, apart from that is, uh, the, the southern region, we used to get railway warrants from Waterloo to Southampton, and uh, many times I was I was hauled by these uh, bullied uh, Pacific locomotives, which uh, they, they they still gave me a bit of a thrill even then. I can remember, in fact, one time 
um, when I was with a pal of mine going from Waterloo, and we'd missed the regular uh, service train that we were going to going to go to Wal uh, to Southampton on, and um, so we, we couldn't use our railway warrants on the next one was because it was um, it was the Bournemouth Bell, which was all first class. But this is something I, I, at the time, I was very umming and ahhing about. But now looking back, it was, uh, I'm so glad I did it. We paid the extra and went to Southampton behind one of these uh, bullied, it was a light Pacific. And when we got to Southampton, several of the lads were laughing at me because I ran down the front of the platform to see the engine. And there it was, big, great, big, uh, three three four zero three six Westwood Ho with the name still up on the boiler side, and uh, that was one of a, a few experiences which told me that the love of railways had, had never really gone away. Anyway, I came out of the Merchant Navy when I was twenty one, and uh, although it was only about three years, it seemed like forever, and. Um, I ended up working at Bryant and Mays um, in East London. And the factory I worked in, we could see all the um, the locos and uh, uh, stuff going to um, going to uh, Norwich, Ipswich, uh, and, and the eastern side uh, of Britain. Plus, of course, a lot of freight workings. But, it, it, of course, it was all diesel hauled, but it got me interested again. So I started jotting down the numbers and invariably bought a modern-day uh, Ian Allen ABC and started started the hobby all over again. Um, at that time, I was about to embark on um, a, a journey with Rob Woodward, my business partner, he also had been a, a, a train spotter, and we we uh, loved music. We both had been in bands, and uh, we decided we had it a lot in common, and we wanted to um, do some sound recording of our music and form a band and do all sorts of different things. And um, his mother very kindly gave us the uh, her front room to make to build our own studio. Well. I won't go into great detail, but eventually we ended up uh, recording the biggest second, sorry, the second biggest selling uh, British single of 1972, which was called Mouldy Old Doe. And it was um, and we had a little sideline band called Lieutenant Pigeon. Our main band was called Stavely Makepeace, and that was the one we wanted to to push and promote. Um, but sadly, um, we we did do Top of the Pops with uh, Stavely Makepeace in 1970. But it was the sideline band that uh, that it was a novelty instrumental an instrumental type band, and that was the one that took off. And um, uh, we we had uh, about eight years solid um, work out of that, and we earned quite a bit of money. But getting back to the railways. Um, because Rob Woodward and myself, and funnily enough, Steve Johnson, who was also in the band, had also been a train spotter. But uh, me and Rob, uh, we'd uh, when we were we'd made it sort of we'd we'd uh, got a decent uh, some decent equipment in the studio, and we were doing quite well. Um, but we we still liked to go out, especially writing songs. We'd go and sit on the railway embankment, watch the trains, and. Uh, and um, and try and compose music. Uh, we used to love the Deltics that ran on the East Coast Main Line, and and of course the the diesel hydraulics, which by this time, which was about 1973-74, they were being phased out. Now one day I can remember it was 1974 in the summer, and we were sitting on Taunton Station in the West Country watching the um, mainly the um, the Western diesel hydraulics by then because the warships and the Hymex and those funny little North British things, I think they were, they were all virtually gone. And there we were sitting on the station when Rob turned to me and said, uh, there's been a lot of sound recording albums of, um, of steam engines over the years, which have been highly successful. But has anyone recorded the diesels? So I said, you know, I don't know. So 
we went to see the the head of Argo Records because they were affiliated to Decca, which was the record company we were working with. And the, the, the head of Argo Records was called Kit Shuttleworth, a lady who was very amenable. And she she said, well, we've got our Argo Transaccord um, section of the business, but it's all run by Peter Hanford. You'll have to speak to him, see what he thinks. So we phoned up and had a meeting with Peter Hanford. Lovely bloke. He, re he re really was good. He was... Uh, very much into steam and very, very good sound recordist. Anyway, he had no interest at all in diesels. He called them blue boxes. And he said, if you want to charge your arm and record um, these uh, th th these diesels, please be my guest. So we thought, why not? And we bought a Sony, oh, what was it? Uh, not a Sony. I can't remember the name. It might come back to me. A little portable tape recorder, which uh, was... Oh, it was a U-H-E-R. That's what it was. Report Stereo, it was called. And uh, we, we bought that and we adapted some stuff to, so we could battery operate different pieces of equipment. And we went out to the line side and started recording these Western diesel hydraulics. H hydraulics. We started in... A, August 1974, and before the end of the year, we had, oh, we had hours of the damn things. We had all sorts of recordings. So we went back to Kit Shuttleworth, and she said, uh, okay, um, uh, I'll chance it. I'll put this out as, as an, a long-playing record and call it Westerns. Well, that came out in 1975, and by pure chance, we were appearing on the Bay City Rollers show at Granada Television uh, up in Manchester, and um, the producer, Muriel Young, was another delightful lady, long since died, I'm afraid, she, she's gone now, but she was a lovely lady, and she... Um, we were telling her over lunch that uh, about this project of ours, and she was fascinated. So she got, after we'd done our little stint on the show, she got the drummer out of uh, out of the Bay City Rollers to interview us and about this long playing record. Well, we we just did a quick interview and explained as best as we could what it was all about, and uh, and the show went out. But, of course, being the Bay City Rollers show, it had a huge audience. And um, the the demand for that L LP just shot through the roof. I don't know if people were buying it because they thought it was music or what, but it became their biggest selling non-musical record in the history of their, of their uh, Argo records. Well, of course, Kit then it said, can you do any more? We did we went on to do the deltics and after that diesels in the highlands she wanted five and in fact we would have carried on and uh, by this time it was about 1977 and we would have carried on and done another one another two i think one was uh, at the english electric type fours or so i can't remember now those last two never came to fruition though because uh, rob and i um we decided uh, we, we would put all our money into a, a doomed project. We started our own record label, which sadly <laughs> was a, a just a pit to throw money in in the end. But but that's another story. I carried on um, with the hobby of railways um, during the 1970s, 80s, and right up to this day. In 19, when would it be? I started going, we, we were over in Germany in 75 and I saw they still had steam, steam engines. So I was going to Germany and watching their steam. And when that ended in 77, I ventured, uh, well, 76, I ventured to um, East Germany where there were a lot more steam engines. And as they were being phased out, I ended up going to Poland. I think some incredible, incredible amount of times Um I just fell in love with the, the steam workings because they weren't museum locomotives all tarted up and polished and just uh, pottering along at 25 miles an hour. They were the, the real thing and they were dirty and, oh, wonderful days, wonderful days. 
But by 1991, um, even Poland was uh, losing its steam. And uh, that was the last year I ever went. And um, I did, uh, incidentally, in 1981, I did the trip of a lifetime and went to China. I had six weeks. It was magnificent because they were actually building steam engines at that time. And it was uh, it was terrific to see them working. Um, some of the lines were 100% steam. There were a few diesels, but it was very, very old-fashioned then. Uh, again, that's all over now. But uh, getting back to the 1991 time, um, we had our studio running. We were doing advertising jingles and voiceovers, and we were still making records and uh, recording other people. It was It was a hectic time. And uh, as I say, the hobby has gone on from that day and uh, and it still goes on today. Um, in the mid 80s, I started videoing trains. Um, this did overlap with um, the, my last few trips to East Germany and Poland, although I only ever videoed one East German steam working and that was in 1987 when I was on my way to Poland, by which time East Germany had very, very few steam locomot locomotives working. In Poland, um, I did take the video camera a few times and I got some superb video shots of their steam locomotives working. Sadly, nobody seems that interested in this country in foreign steam. They love the British stuff, understandably. It's what you know, it's what you're familiar with. But um, since those days, since the steam's finished, I have uh, followed this, the railway uh, development in this country. It's, it's sad because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a graph that goes downhill rather, rather than up. And uh, our freight uh, services are dwindling. And um, I managed to make some videos uh, using these... Um, the, what was left of our, our diesels and I did a, a series called Branch Lines of Britain with Bill Boswell that's um, that's been a good seller um, and also I managed to get hold of a lot of cine film of British steam which I hadn't taken myself which was um, which was uh, done by various guys the late Bill Garbutt who had a magnificent selection Neville Sims, who's still with us at this point in time, and although he's over 90 now. And uh, by using the, the original cine film and enhancing it and adding soundtracks, we have had many, many uh, uh, CD, uh, sorry, DVDs and, and uh, before that, videos of these, um, of these showing the nostalgic days of British steam. Um, Today, I I still like to keep abreast of the of the diesel scene in this country, and that's changing rapidly even now as I speak. But um, and it is nice to get out with the camera on a nice sunny day, especially if there's something unusual working. And I don't mean a, a special train full of enthusiasts. They don't interest me as much as uh, 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 working on a branch line, which will probably happen once every six months and you have to be there just at the right time but anyway it is a superb hobby and um as a as a, a testament to all the bits and bobs i've done over the years it's nice to have these uh the three albums uh, at long playing vinyl albums that's westerns deltics and the third one was diesels in the highlands that's that to, for my money is the best because you you really hear the engines working hard um then there's all the old um videos that i still have uh, to, to remind me and um and nowadays of course you don't, you can put it in a matchbox two or three hours or, or more of uh, high quality um, uh, recording of, of anything, railways, anything. And uh, because it all goes on an SD card, this, this magnificent invention today. Oh boy, if we'd have had that in the old days. Because in, in the days of cinefilm, you had to be very, very careful what you took because you only had a four minute reel 
and uh, it cost it cost quite quite a lot of money in comparison to the times and you had to try and remember what to take what not to take and uh, thankfully i did a lot of cines i've got a, some good stuff on cine as well but uh, as i say if we had the sd cards in those days you can just let them run you just uh, set the camera up let it run and uh, you can then edit it down and keep the best bits there's one little, um, well, there, there, there are many little anecdotes. One little thing I do remember whilst talking about the um, the cine film era. I remember in a mid seventies, I think it was. I was in Dundee, and I had my cine camera with me. Uh, I, I was filming the class twenty sixes and twenty sevens at the time. And uh, I didn't have a great deal of footage left, so I was being very sparing with the use of it, when suddenly I saw one of these little 06 diesel shunters coming rattling up towards the station. It was going off to the docks. Oh, boy, do I regret not having filmed that. At the time, I thought, well, I can't waste this on a shunter. But, wow, if only I'd have done that, because nobody would have thought of doing that, and uh, including me. That's one little incident. There are many, many uh, memories of uh, being out, um, watching trains, recording them, photographing them. Perhaps one of the one of the uh, funniest would have going back in time again to 1974 when Rob and I first went out to Reading Station to to sound record the um the westerns the diesel hydraulic hydraulic class 52s and we were on the platform uh on the uh, minding our own business at the end we set up all the, our equipment something you would probably get locked up for today and we were recording away when some young boys obviously were had seen us on the tv and <laughs> about 20 kids came round and uh, ruined the recording, of course, sort of rat rattling away, asking us for autographs. Got any photographs, any records with you? <laughs> it made us realise the, the price of fame and how, how valuable privacy can be. But anyway, um, as for today's scene, we've got uh, we've still got a, a bit of interest. An awful lot of people have dropped out of the hobby because it, it, it isn't the variety anymore. Just about everything you see is hauled, uh, diesel-wise, it's hauled by a Class 66 now. There are a few odds and ends, but it isn't uh, the variety that it used to be. But nevertheless, it's still a great hobby, and uh, it's relaxing. It gets you out into the open air, gets you to places you would never normally go to, and it's always a challenge. So... Let's hope that a few more people discover it. <laughs> so, there are a few youngsters, but uh, nothing like those heady days back in the 1950s when virtually, I'd say, about uh, 70 to 80 percent of young boys and a few girls would uh, regularly um, go to the line side, sit on the end of platforms and just watch trains all day. Mm -hmm. 